<laughs> hello everybody, hello. Just a quick video about how the topological solution to the boundary problem can address the meta problem of consciousness. So here's the thing. I think that you know the topological solution to the boundary problem, to the binding problem, is actually capable of addressing a lot of very standard classic problems in philosophy of mind. In particular, I think it can actually solve <laughs> four, you know, very big questions uh, posed by David Chalmers in completely different papers over the years, you know, across his career. I think the topological solution to the boundary problem is capable of addressing the hard problem of consciousness, dancing qualia, the meta problem, and also a combination problem for panpsychism. Now, this video <laughs> will be focused on the meta problem of consciousness. So for context, the meta problem is why is it that we find consciousness puzzling? And why is it that we talk about it, that we can talk about consciousness? Like why is, you know, the causal structure for being able to talk about consciousness something that maybe seems facilitated or um, functionally realized by consciousness itself, very related to, you know, philosophical zombies. Well, here is the solution, I think. So it's not that the material itself, you know, can can express itself. It's not like, you know, iron or, or gold. You can say, hey, I'm gold. <laughs> you know, obviously you need some intricate computational machinery in order to kind of like take some material property and make it causally efficacious to arrive at a place where it can quote unquote talk about itself. I think consciousness is computationally non-trivial. It's actually an extremely general dynamic and multifaceted uh, component in a nervous system that has such finicky, strange, you know, states that from the point of view of the system, it actually makes a lot of sense to model it as a spatial, a special component of it. So here's one example. I think, okay, consciousness is actually recruiting field computing. It's a kind of like non-standard computational medium. So we're talking about something that isn't really kind of a classical neural network and isn't really either, you know, a digital computer. Uh, it's more kind of like, for example, a nonlinear optical icing solver. You know, an icing solver is essentially a computational system that figures out how to satisfy as many constraints as possible. Uh, the classic formulation is something like, you know, every atom is trying to align with its surrounding atoms. And usually you will use annealing in order to essentially satisfy these constraints. Uh, and there are some materials such as nonlinear optical systems that are capable of extremely efficiently finding, you know, an orientation for each of the atoms such that as many of the atoms as possible are actually aligned with their neighbors. So here is a case where you're using the special, you know, material physical properties of a system in order to accelerate computation. So think about it this way. The conscious component of the nervous system, which let's say it's, for example, the patchwork of local field potentials across the entire brain, has unique, strange, finicky type of computational properties. It is like trying to fine tune, you know, a <laughs> nonlinear optical system in order to solve things such as the icing problem. Okay, so if you have that, then you also have kind of like a wrapper that is actually made of, you know, a very classical, you know, digital neural network. It would make sense for that wrapper to essentially create a, have a model, have some sort of like sense or internal language about the fact that it is interfacing with this very strange and finicky subcomponent of the system. 
Uh, in that sense, you know, if you have kind of a computers that have both a classical, you know, <laughs> typical digital type of neural network that are hooked up to something that is using holistic field behavior for a computation, it would make a lot of sense, you know, if you have a society of those computers, that it would have special terms to refer to the unique computations that the field behavior are performing. Um, and that is because, you know, it breaks in all sorts of ways. I mean, even if you talk about humans, okay, like mental illness, there's all kinds of corner cases or failure modes for the conscious component. And so it makes a lot of sense for the non-conscious component to have a language about it, to be able to talk about it. Uh, more so, you know, if there are, you know, unique runtime complexity uh, properties to these medium, in a sense, it's going to be very hard to fake. Like, you could make a quote-unquote philosophical zombie, essentially, by modeling the input and output behavior of that component of you know of the field component of the nervous system but it's going to take a long while for you to actually be able to build let's say like a lookup table for that that is because there's a huge combinatorial explosion and more so um especially when it gets very large simulating it is going to be very tricky i'm not saying that it's impossible to simulate it's just that the reason why you know to begin with the non-conscious component, you know, might have, in some sense, like, made sense of or developed a language for the conscious component is because it has unique, you know, advantages when it comes to the runtime complexity for solving particular problems. And so if, you know, you were to replace that by kind of like a classical component, then all of a sudden, you know, the runtime complexity advantages wouldn't be there. And all of a sudden, you know, it would kind of become transparent. You know, there wouldn't be like a actual kind of like difference in computational paradigm between the conscious and non-conscious components. And, you know, the other thing to add on top of that is that at least, you know, in the current human implementation and maybe non-human animal as well, but yeah, essentially the natural, you know, conscious organisms that we have, they actually use a phenomenal self, kind of like this illusion of being a component of your experience. And, you know, the entire operating system is grounded on that premise that, you know, there is a component of your experience that is special because it is, it is who you are. And essentially it is the part that is like intimately wired with a lot of valence levers, right? Like <laughs> hurting the table in front of you, you know, unless you have really strong attachments to it, um, doesn't hurt as much as like hurting your arm or something like that. And likewise for, for pleasures. And so... It would make a lot of sense that, yeah, if you have, again, a conscious component, it has, you know, unique information processing properties, unique runtime complexity that exists in a society of a lot of other, you know, computers that are, you know, partly non-conscious and partly conscious. And on top of that, the conscious component has a phenomenal self that kind of creates the operating system <laughs> for how to navigate the environment. Given all of those conditions, it actually makes a lot of sense that the organism as a whole would have specialized, specialized terminology to refer to the various states of this field behavior, of this field component. And <laughs> that is why, you know, without any kind of strange, you know, st strong emergence or dualism or anything of the sort, we can explain why we talk about consciousness and why is it so puzzling to us and hence <laughs> provide a original new and you know non-trivial solution to the meta problem of consciousness <laughs> hopefully this was clarifying all of these will be putting writing essentially you know <laughs> creating the full argumentative tree for why I think the topological solution to the boundary problem is promising, but this was a, you know, a piece of the puzzle. So <laughs> until next time, infinite bliss, take care. Ciao.